All right, everyone, welcome. Welcome. Uh, we have a, a great uh, event today for you, uh, hosted by Melissa Gonzalez. Uh, Melissa, do you want to do a quick intro of yourself? And we can take a, a moment to uh, give a quick intro on each of the panelists' side. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to speak with everyone today. Again, my name is Melissa Gonzalez. I am the CEO and founder of the Lioness Group and a principal and shareholder in MG2. Um, we really sit at the heart of physical retail experiences, all the way from you know, ideation and strategic planning to design and build out. So um, really looking forward to diving deeper with our panelists on how they're going to approach the new norm. Awesome. Awesome. Brewer, do you want to go next? Sure. My name is Brewer Stauffer, and I am uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. <clears throat> I am the owner, founder and owner of uh, a local pizzeria chain, the Roman Candle. And we specialize in a lot of farm-to-table gourmet pizzas. So if you're in the Madison area, come check us out. Awesome, Brewer. Peter, how about you? Sure. I'm Peter Bogard. Um, I lead brand strategy for Dooney & Burke, a handbag and accessories company based out of Norwalk, Connecticut. Uh, and so I deal day to day with marketing, e-commerce and customer service. Awesome. Tom? Thanks, Bobby. Hi guys, my name is Tom Kalsgaard, uh, founder and owner at Rally Point Endeavors. We are a fitness and recovery facility. We, we passionately coin ourselves as kind of the, the healthcare clinic of the future. And so we have four locations, a bunch of members in the North Chicago area and i um, happy and appreciative to be, a, to be brought along here. Awesome. Awesome. Mr. Nick. Yes. So I'm uh, Nick Chavello, CEO of Simplify. We uh, provide advanced connectivity solutions and cloud-based services to customers. Awesome. And I'll go last and hand it back to you, Melissa. I'm Bobby Marhamat. Uh, I'm CEO of Radiant. Uh, we are a cloud digital signage platform, uh, helping, helping locations create phenomenal experiences in location. Melissa, back to you. Great. Okay, so just to set the stage a bit for the audience that's listening in today, um, we are going to kind of have a three-phased conversation, first touching upon the current state of retail, you know, challenges as we approach phases of openings and that first wave of that. Uh, plans to adapt um, because we are definitely going to be in a learn, listen, and iterate mode in these coming months. And where we see that technology can help with the transformation in the future um, as we continue to move forward. Um, so to kick off that conversation, I actually want to talk to, uh, to you first, Brewer. Um, given, given the sort of business that you're in, you've kind of been engaged at the front lines pretty much this whole time engaging with consumers and, and really seeing how sentiment has continued to evolve. So can you tell us what, you know, kind of what you've been gleaning being there at the pulse of the consumer? I will do my best. Uh, we have been open since the beginning of the stay at home orders. Um, I have been in my stores daily. I've been delivering pizzas. We've uh, donated a bunch of food to frontline um, in addition to ER workers, policemen, uh, bus drivers, and uh, people's sentiments, I think, are all over the place from this pizza it could be radioactive. You know, as soon as you drop the pizza off, they want you to like get back in your car before someone opens their door, all the way to people who, you know, greet me with a six foot air hug, basically. So um, I, I think what we're gonna see is a, the new normal will be for different people cleanliness, face masks, there's going to be, there's going to be a variety out there. I think we're all going to have to adjust to that. Yeah, absolutely. And what I think is really interesting about this conversation today too, is you, you all intersect customers in different ways because you're in totally different industries. We have, F, we have food, uh, we have fitness, and then we have luxury accessories. So, it, you know, you, you, and geographically diverse too, which is going to make this even more interesting because, you know, there's different rules too, from con con county to city to state that we're all going to have to be mindful of as well. Um, so, so Tom, you, you know, with, with Rally Point, you guys have been staying engaged with your consumers, right? You've been doing teleworkouts. Um, and so in that sense, that emotional connection has been there. And I'm sure many of them are craving to come back into the space physically as well. What is your first phase of openings going to look like? Oh, yeah. So I think, I think what Brewer said, it, it applies across all three of us panelists. And so it's very interesting because what you're trying to do is continue to serve the masses of your community 
um, but do so in a way that a person that, that wants to limit a touch as much as possible still feels welcome. And so we actually closed down a little bit before the stay at home order, just, just for, um, uh, just to make sure from a social perspective, we looked like we were kind of leading the charge on this. Um, but within that, and you mentioned it in kind of your, your briefing is, it was a learn and iterate and we iterated very, very quickly. And I'm so happy to be on the line with Radiant because they helped us with that. And, and what, what it is, is instead of our members being able to come in facility for both the training and the recovery components, we've gone to these tele-meetings. And so what that means for us though, is we are, we are running 12 classes a day currently. You have anything from strength training to cardio training and everything are, the opportunity here was really to give options to our members as well as hold them accountable. And so when they're on screen working out with their peers and a coach watching them, they're held accountable and they have a bunch of different options. And so we found that is kind of the best way to work. And, and as we talk about kind of the phased approach, ideally in Illinois, we're in the phase three, which should be early June, but it's really an iteration. We want you to show the members that there's safety, that we put that first, but then we're iterating the offering and trying to get back to kind of the new normal, which isn't gonna be the same as to what it was, but it'll be a new normal that everybody can be comfortable with. Are you thinking about, because we've heard different responses from, uh, from the fitness industry, are you thinking about appointment-based um, workouts? Are you thinking of circuit you know, training and then you, you kind of leave space for cleanings in between? Um, what are you thinking about and how are you proactively planning to communicate that to your customers? That's a great question. So, so from the Radiant perspective, I think, I think technology for us is the ability to actually go live with workouts and with coaching now. And you can see the facility behind us and you can actually see white taped out areas. And what this, the technology does is it delivers the opportunity for the member to actually see what's happening in our space. And so what we pride ourselves on is really coach and instructor led fitness. So it is group classes. And so as people come back, the social distancing will be there. The class sizes will be capped. And, and usually we have classes that'll be 30 members with three or four coaches. And now that has to come down to less than 10, at least for phase one. And so we will do that. So you'll have additional classes. They'll probably run a little bit shorter because not only should the member clean on the way in and the way out, but, but then we wanna do a deep cleaning in between those times as well. And we have a really, it's actually a pretty cool um, kind of technology, but it's actually a sprayer. And what this sprayer does is it settles. There's no residue left, but it actually kills, the, or kills all viruses from the inside out. So we're gonna do that in between each of the classes as well. And ideally members, as they, as they kind of come in, they see all of this cleaning happening because the number one, I, I always say this to the family and friends, but I would eat off our training floor, but you need to show them that they have the ability to do that as well during this time because they're gonna come here and get preventive healthcare versus getting sick. That's great. I think communication is going to be more important than ever. Proactive communication so that you can ease people's minds, you know, before, as they're entering the space and there's, there's clarity for what they can expect. Uh, so Peter, you have, uh, your brand, you have 25 locations, correct? So you, you have a pretty complex strategy, I'm sure in place. And again, not every county or city or state is going to be created equal. So how, how are you guys approaching this first phase of openings? I mean, I think, uh, Tom kind of hit it nail on the head when he talked about we're iterating and, and thinking through this every day, right? Every 15 minutes, something changes. I think that we have to continue to be agile. I think we have to evaluate this as an opportunity. I think we have to look at assets across the organization and ways that we can enhance the communication and conversation with uh, our, our brand evangelists and, and end consumers. Um, so of course there's a series of kind of table space expectations that are going to happen and be mandated by mall operators, um, coming around to reduced hours to have increased cleanings, um, ma uh, managing social distancing, free masks and gloves being provided. Um, but I look at that as really like the, the, the kind of means to an ends. Um, whereas I think what we're focused on is figuring out how that whole process and conversation extends to the virtual and digital space. Uh, so the idea is that we're evaluating perhaps new business models. Um, we've seen a transition of stores into showrooms where people come and browse, but they don't actually buy. And so we're thinking, how do we extend that conversation beyond a showroom? Uh, and what does that look like? Um, so I think that there's probably ways we may borrow from hospitality and, and do something where it's this idea of almost a, a menu of offers that are distributed 
and then you come by for curbside pickup. It's playing up destination. Um, it's allowing for opportunities of home try-on. It's extending customer service and ex customer experience into people's homes. Uh, I think the important thing is that our store associates are really the ones that are the front line of the brand, are the front line of the customer experience, um, and, and they're a tremendous asset. We want to make sure that they have the opportunity to engage with consumers, whether that's virtual try-ons, whether that's style consultations, but a lot of this is going to use technology to effectively uh, improve their reach beyond the bounds of the store. Uh, we used to think a lot about like it was our responsibility as a brand to drive destination into the store and then it was the store and the associates responsibility to kind of clientele and sell. I think what we're doing is we're starting to say that there's no longer that barrier of the door, that there's kind of you have to extend the store associate into the home um, of the end consumer. Absolutely. And it's interesting, too, because uh, we as consumers are adopting that so much now, right? And being so accepting to it. Um, I can say in the past couple of days, I've, I've, I've embarked on that myself. I, I did a, a beauty chat with um, a beauty professional from the Chanel Atelier because they're closed. And I spent 45 minutes on the phone with him learning about eye makeup. And it was probably more time than I would have spent if I went into the store itself. So, you know, you're actually seeing the average amount of engagement per consumer going up in this virtual world when it is happening. So it's gonna be interesting how we then tie that back together as stores start to reopen. Um, how, are, how are you guys thinking then about kind of reconditioning and retraining your staff or your in-store in associates, your trainers, et cetera, um, to kind of adapt to these new expectations that consumers are gonna have? So Melissa, let me, I'll, let me step in on that one. I, or at least start the conversation. It's very, very interesting because the, the number one thing that has helped us the most stay afloat and also for member engagement is actually almost allowing our coaches to be taken home. And so we've put in coaches with individual members and we have a whole lot more members than coaches, but just through email contacts, through texting, through FaceTime calls, through personal calls, it has like the members always come back and they feel such an emotional connection to our talent. And that's the number one thing that I want to deliver as our talent. So, so as Peter said, like that is going to be at the forefront. And what you're also doing is allowing your talent to keep developing their talents during this time. Because what you don't want is a stale sales force to just sit there and, and you know, collect dust. So we're keeping them active. And actually with that human connection and, and conversation, you're not only helping the member, but you're further understanding what, how the member feels about coming back into your facility, you know? So that's the best research you can possibly do. And now it's just, as Peter said, we're just iterating every 15 minutes just to make sure, because what you want is, you want every member to feel comfortable or every customer to feel comfortable coming in on day one, even if they don't. And then the best marketing tool we have is our members. So you want them to be able to tell their friends, hey, look, I went in, safe environment, clean environment. I got the exact same thing I had before this whole thing happened, which is just very good health and fitness. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, as a restaurant operator and as I serve on uh, the, the Madison Tourism Board, uh, Convention and Visitors Bureau Board, so these the issues of hospitality and destination marketing are things that I, I do think about quite a bit. And it's all over the board when it comes to states that are reopening. Uh, Georgia has released rules on how you're going to need to operate. A lot of the restaurant, different restaurant associations have released them and they all kind of come down to have a plan for cleanliness, have a plan to evolve constantly, have a plan for 25, 50, 75 percent occupancy. And um, I, I, I really do believe that we're going to see waves of opening and waves of closures over the next 12 to 18 months. So those of us who are aware of that and are planning for that and actively engaging that, I, I think that's the right spirit to use the word Peter used. Uh, uh, you know, if we're, if we're iterative, if we're constantly in that agile mindset, I, I do believe that those are the businesses and operators that, that are gonna find the opportunity here because they're people are hungry, metaphorically and literally for social engagement, for trying food, uh, just real quick, one of the ways we've evolved is, hey, we, we're master pizza makers. That's what we do. We've been doing it for 15 years. We use big deck ovens. We're great at it. But one of the things we've done is we've started offering take and bake pizza kits. 
and they've been very popular. And one of the reasons is, is because people are home all the time with their kids. So what we're doing as a restaurant who has a lot of dine in business, we're finding ways to kind of take our craft and put it in people's homes and give them guidance and encourage them to post on social media. So I think it's ideas like that, that especially for the next 12 to 18 months are gonna keep us relevant as we figure out how we can not go back to the way things were, but go back to where a Friday night is packed and there's a waiting list and people are, are you know, hungry to dine out. Yeah. I'll say I've ordered some kits, not, not from you, unfortunately, because I'm not in Wisconsin. <laughs> well, hey, we'll FedEx them. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Uh, because I have a four-year-old who needs to be occupied as much as possible. So it is nice to have those activities. But, you know, what you guys are all talking about is like, it's time to, it's really important to just lean in and be human. And whether you're selling a product or, or a service, we're all in the service industry right now. We really are, right? And we need to be at, at the service of our, of our customers. And I think that there's very organic ways to do it like you mentioned kind of bring the product to the home and then there's the implementation of technology to help further the opportunities to either do client telling and stuff so i wanted to i want to talk a little bit about he, how each one of you are approaching that so maybe we can start with you this time peter but how are you thinking of utilizing tools to help um to help kind of you know a create a seamless environment maybe for curbside is that something that you guys are considering in, in your portfolio of stores and then how are you how are you balancing out keeping that process as efficient as possible but also layering in uh, a branded experience i mean i think the the kind of the first discussions that we had in early march were really around business continuity and this seems like fundamentals but there's a lot of businesses that aren't built to operate outside of the walls of where they perform their actions. Uh, and, and so I think that there are certain teams that were able to move to remote environment almost seamlessly overnight. There are other teams that it's still a, a work in progress every day. So I think first and foremost, we're investing in digital tools that allow for business continuity and kind of the, the proof of concept is that all you should be able to, you should be able to take your laptop anywhere and work from anywhere. Uh, and what I think that does is that there's, inherent legacy systems that build silos in every business that you may have a, a point of sale system for your stores that's different than your point of sale system for e-commerce and so they're they're not compatible and can't talk um, you may have customer databases that are siloed by business units because again legacy uh, so i think what we're focused on is building collaborative tools that allow all of our business units to kind of speak a common language so that's one of the, the first investments that we've made. I think the second thing I talk about a lot is that we've shifted like the tools of selling from maybe a harder sell to a softer sell. And what that means is we, we've watched marketing be reframed as storytelling. Um, and I think now we're looking at how do we build compelling content that keeps people engaged with our brand, even though they may not be consuming our product. Um, so we're thinking about different ways of meeting them with content. So I'd say that's the second pillar. And then I really think the third pillar that we're focused on is is representation. Um, that we deal with a product that fortunately it's not like shoes. Uh, it's not apparel in which you have to physically try it on. It comes in direct contact with the body. But if you watch someone walk into our store, the first thing they do is, is they touch that bag. They feel the leather um, and it's referred to as the hand feel. So we're trying to figure out ways of being able to tell the story of the product, be able to provide the haptic feedback that you need without actually having the consumer touch the product. So we've recently invested in uh, software that's allowing us to model our product that will allow us to embed uh, uh, augmented reality into our app, into our website. So you can literally take a bag, look at it on a table in your house, walk around it. Um, the other thing we've invested in is more kind of evocative video content. So doing these, instead of using spec shots of a bag on a white background, starting to tell a story through video itself. Uh, and then another piece of that is we, we've doubled down on blog and, and writing content there. So speaking to how a detachable strap may work, speaking to how we're staying occupied throughout the day. Uh, and the other piece with content is that we also want content in there that surprises and delights. So, I mean, we, we hopped on the bandwagon of coloring books, taking some of our most iconic prints. Um, we've done Zoom backgrounds. Um, we've done Instagram stories around kind of coffee drinks, uh, cocktails. And so it's this, this content that kind of 
fits adjacent to the brand, but is not a pillar of the brand to keep people coming back and servicing them. So I'd say that those are really three investments that we're making. One is around continuity. Um, the second is um, really making sure that it's content. And the third is around the representation and the connection to the brand itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So it, for, for, for curbside, I can, I can pivot it a little bit maybe for, for Brewer and Tom, because your businesses are different, right? It doesn't have the same fulfillment strategy as say Peter's, but um, how do you, how do you think you could incorporate or rethink the opportunity with your outdoor spaces um, to, to complement what's happening inside those four walls and giving you more breathing room for physical distancing um, and community building? I think the thing that I need to do is sell more pizza and then more people will go visit Tom. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> you guys should tag team that strategy for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, this is a great question and it's stuff we've looked into for years in terms of beacon technology, in terms of, uh, you know, having people be able to order on their phone, uh, directly interfacing with our, with our point of sale. Peter brought up uh, some of that interoperability. It's tough to, it's tough to get past, but I mean, that, that's where my head is right now. And I don't have solutions, but the questions I have is how can we better put the experience of ordering in the customer's hands, right? Whether it's kiosks, whether it's uh, menu boards that are, that are letting them know what today's special, you know, beers are or the, the, the daily taps or whatever. And so finding ways to <clears throat> literally put the touch points in the consumer's hands. That's, that's what I'm interested in because I, I think we're gonna have smaller workforces. I think you're gonna have the server show up and be sent home because they're say they have a scratch in their throat and you're just not gonna wanna take a chance. So the more we can um, enable personal technology to interface with our systems, I, I, think, I think those of us who are able to do that we'll find a, a, a higher measure of success in the, in the next, you know, in the next 12 to 18 months. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So, so from our perspective, it's interesting. I always, I always wish that for the, for, for the end of March, I could have been on a lot of boards just listening to people talk about what's happening because it's like, it, in, especially in the fitness industry, it's, it's very interesting because what happens is, is my bread and butter is happening behind me. And so what I, what I told the team and what we stuck to is let's iterate to offer enough for our members to stay engaged and then continually improve on that as we're out of facility. But I never, ever want to lose sight of being in facility and what that delivers to folks. And so I think like what you'll notice is a lot of our competitors have either shut their doors or tried to pivot completely. And if you pivot completely instead of in facility, we're going to do DVDs of fitness. There's already people that own that industry. And so you can't like all of a sudden just flip the, flip the switch and say, we're going to do something completely different. And so Brewer said like the next 12 to 18 months, that's super important to just kind of hold serve gather data and really see where this thing, where it comes out. Cause you don't want to make crazy decisions, go against your business plan, who you are. And then all of a sudden in six months or somebody completely different. And that really doesn't matter because you're getting back to where it was. And so we want to be super aware of, of what's happening, but also just relax a touch and just iterate with stuff instead of making crazy decisions. And I think I want to give a shout out here cause it's super important for, from our perspective is Dan at Radiant is my guy. And what we said is instead of like, let's make new DVDs, him and I talked and we said, hey, with that technology, what we can do is bring the experience that's in here, not only to my members' homes, but also different places like, like hotel workout rooms or like all the condo buildings in Chicago, they have fitness facilities downstairs. Everybody goes downstairs. You have a beautiful TV that lights up, Rally Point class runs. We have outfitted those gyms people are six feet away, it's a clean environment, and they follow along. And the coolest thing with the Radiant technology is that TV is gonna start up. And so it, the consumer has to do nothing except follow along and have a great experience. And so that's not getting too far away from what we do, because you're still gonna have the coach, you're gonna have the equipment, you're gonna have the experience. And it's not saying, hey, look, we just wanna go dark in facility. So that's what we're trying to do is really just iterate, but stay within the values because we believe in this concept. We just need to get customers and see how everything kind of shakes out from a, from a safety perspective. 
I think that makes a ton of sense what you talked about, especially with residential, because I, I mean, I personally, residential is going to evolve too, with so many people realizing they can work from home. And even when we all go back, more and more people are going to do that. So I'm sure they're going to want to run downstairs or wherever and get their quick workout from Rally Point. Yep. Awesome. Um, but, so P Peter, as you think of the store, oh, go ahead, Brewer, you go first. I was going to say, it's so interesting to me that we have, you know, a pizza man, a gym owner and a marketing whiz for, uh, you know, higher end, a high end company, uh, you know, a, a high end fashion company and among other people uh, on the panel. And we're all saying the same thing. How can we take our brand, our touch points into the consumer's home? And, and how can we take our voice, whether it's on social media or whether it's through, you know, how can you be authentic to your brand voice and continue to provide and evolve your product. And it's just, it's really cool because just hearing Peter say it and then hearing Tom say it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really interesting, but, it, but um, that just really struck me. It, it was so crystal clear for a second there. I just had to jump in. You know, I think authenticity is, is, is crucial um, because the other conversation that's happening right now is the stickiness of brand loyalty. Um, and people are gravitating to those brands that are, being partners to them right now that are providing a value at service. Um, you know, I, I, there was a lot of jumping ship in the early days of, of when this all happened and things started closing because um, people weren't feeling like they got what they needed from those brands and they, were, they had an appetite to try new. So it's an interesting time for brand loyalty and customer acquisition. And I think the, those that are going to be most successful are those that kind of lean into what, what you just spoke about and do it in an authentic way. Um, and the trick now for everybody is what learnings do you glean from that? The way in which you're interacting with these customers now in a human way, and how does that inform what the in-person expectations are going to be in the future, right? I, I think there's something really interesting that you bring up um, that talks about like customer acquisition and lifetime value. And I tend to believe a lot in pr proposing speculative futures and looking at kind of adjacent brands, and then also looking at digitally native brands. I mean, basically saying, okay, who are the forefront of brands right now that are receiving the lion's share of venture funding and what's going on with them? Because they're kind of the, the lightning rod of, of what's happening. And there's a lot that's been written in the past couple of weeks about this idea of consumer acquisition cost and lifetime value are for the first time intersecting. So if you think about it, like consumer acquisition cost is supposed to kind of be asymptotic and plateau off and lifetime value is supposed to kind of uh, grow over time. And what happens is that you're realizing that some of these digitally native businesses were engaging in aggressive customer acquisition at high costs and that it actually doesn't build a sustainable business model. Because what you're doing is it's a commodity marketplace in which everybody is a direct to consumer brand that cuts out the middleman and you realize that they're, they're only competing on price. And so I think it's incredibly important for us to kind of be authentic, to be true and to stand for something greater than only providing quality um, or, or a race to the bottom on value. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that is. I just feel incredibly fortunate that I work for a brand that has a 45 year history um, and that we have kind of credibility. I think the important thing that we do is we approach every communication now with compassion. And I think you have to realize that there are, are a plurality of views and not a single view when you're communicating as well. Um, and there's also what we've noticed we're kind of having to shift language across the variety of channels to make sure that's mm -hmm. appropriate for each channel and it's compassionate for that channel and it may actually rely <clears> on <throat> different kind of pros. So the way that you speak on Instagram is different than the way, a post versus a story, the way you speak on paid versus organic. Um, even it could be the way that someone engages with web content on mobile versus desktop. Um, so I think that there, it, it's kind of, you, you have to build flexible frameworks that are authentic, that are compassionate, um, and that also don't look too much like they're kind of seizing an opportunity. Um, and, and I don't exactly know what the future holds. I just find it really interesting to observe these digitally native brands and almost where they used to be the playbook of what to do. Um, I look at them right now and say, okay, like what heuristics can I pull out of this as a playbook of what not to do? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's interesting. The fluidity across all of these channels are, are going to be more important than ever for, for brands and retailers, you know, to be able to deliver because people have talked about omni, omni channel forever. Um, it's a customer channel, 
right? And so how do, how do we how do we deliver on that in a very unified way? Um, Bobby and Nick, you you know, I'd love to hear a little bit on your end from you know kind of the technology side, um, you know, kind of what you're seeing in these early phases and how you see this evolving over the next twelve to eighteen months. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, I think what we tell a lot of uh, the customers that we work with, because we get this question all the time, how do I use, you know, use technology or what do I do in this case to be able to you know, connect with my customer and be able to at least keep that, that loyalty with that customer, you know, knowing that during these times, uh, it's all about keeping that connection, furthering that connection as much as possible. And, you know, uh, I think as as people start to get back into store locations, one of the main points uh, are, are for safety. But outside of safety, it's how do I educate my customer about what I'm doing as a brand to, to make sure that I'm thinking about their safety? What do I do to educate them about maybe new products in store, uh, you know, faster than having to interact with, with, a, with a salesperson kind of directly? Uh, what do I do in, in, in store locations to be able to, again, further that connection and educate and inspire my customers um, to, to feel good about, you know, coming back into the store locations. Of course, that's going to take some time, but how do I do that in, in a way where, you know, people are feeling good about reconnecting with my brand? Yeah, and I, I think to kind of add to that point, you know, the connectivity is kind of king in each one of these scenarios. So, and, and two of the three are small businesses, right? So this is all brand new kind of concept for them of trying to understand infrastructure and how do I use technology? And you just don't want it to be a cost to them, right? Can they turn this into a, a net positive? Can they turn some of this digital signage into marketing opportunities? Um, what happens if their existing infrastructure can't handle what they're looking to put onto it? Because the reality of it is, it's going to be here for a while, right? And their strains are going to be uh, things that they need to look at because if now these systems go down, right, their business is going to be severely impacted. Where it maybe wasn't like that before, or maybe it was just a credit card machine went down for uh, a half hour or an hour. Now it's their whole business, right? So I think you really need to look at it holistically, but also be able to give them the abilities to be able to own that as a small business owner, for example and not have to spend an enormous amount of money uh, to invest in a brand new infrastructure. I have someone that's coming out to constantly maintain these things and be able to do it remotely and monitor these things. Uh, so, so those are some of the big things that I think we're trying to help with our customer base um, and really educate them on how, how we can help and how we can really look at uh, uh, supporting them uh, as they move the business forward. Um, do you, uh, so this could be either Bobby or Nick or both, but how do you work with your clients and brands, you know, I work with Tom Brewer, or Peter, um, and helping them wrap their head too around the ROI of some of those investments, right? Because I feel like that's been a big hurdle of implementation. It's like, will consumers interact with this? And what, what does ROI look like? And to me, that's kind of a evolving conversation now. Yeah, I mean, um, I'll, I'll just step in real quickly. We, we have a, an example. We have a joint partner uh, that we work with uh, up in uh, Syracuse, New York, where we came in, and it's a company called Servomation, and, and they do smart vending. Um, and they were trying to figure out how they can reduce their IT expenditure. Uh, they can't be on existing networks. They need standalone networks. Um, but they also want to try drive revenue. Right, so being able to put in and customize a solution, we're able to increase their revenues by 30%, not only in sales, but the opportunity to be able to market for some of the products that they're selling because eyeballs are gonna be in different places now, right? Um, uh, in brewers, you might, might be a, uh, someone ordering from a digital uh, sign, right? So there's marketing opportunities there. And then, you know, trying to make sure that their infrastructure cost goes down. So in that case, we were able to save 80% month over month uh, in their IT maintenance, but increase their revenues in marketing dollars 30%. And so, you know, each business is different. And so we come in and look and we start to look at these different opportunities and provide solutions. And it could be something that's outside of, of, of what we offer, right? There's other technology partners out there communication with these people is going to be key and keeping in touch with their customer base is going to be extremely key. So how can they do that digitally um, and without a major impact on uh, their, their employee base? Mm -hmm. 
right? So it's all those types of things that we come in and try to help. Mm -hmm. I think I think Tom uh, brought up a good point as well. Like, how, how do you how do you actually you know during these times how do you help consult um, customers how to create other other channels to connect with their with their customers? Not not go pivot your business completely, but how do you add to it and connect with people where they want to be connected? And, and I think that's one of the things that you know that we do uh, day in and day out is is work with our clients. And uh, you know, uh, Nick brought up another good point. Like, how do we how do we use uh, quick connectivity to be able to be in a place where we can deploy solution in a way where there's two buckets that people are thinking about right now, savings and revenue, right? And so how do I save money or how do I uh, connect, connect with my customers and be able to increase revenue down the line? And so we help them in these two channels or even combined channels to be able to come up with solutions, whether it's, you know, putting up, uh, you know, a, a sign in, in a window uh, where they don't have to touch the IT network and be able to, you know, do curbside, you know, quickly uh, in a restaurant or retail environment? Or how do we go in the back office and deploy something for, for customer communication as people are coming in? Right now, you have customers are not coming in, but a lot of employees are coming in. So how do you, how do you actually make them feel comfortable as well with the flow of orders coming in and keeping, you know, the safe distances and, and continue to inform and educate them as well? So I think there's different solutions uh, based on the client. But I think one of the biggest, biggest points is how do you, how do you create that? How do you help business owners create that additional channel to connect their customers? Uh, and how do we do that in a way where technology can help them do that and, and continue to have that connection as, as things get back to a new normal, if you will? Hey, hey Melissa, one other thing I'd add too is the other, the other thing here is say Brewer was actually in North Chicago. Our ability for him to have credibility with his customers when it comes to safety, when it comes to quality, all of those things. And then as you look at signage, and you go into brewers restaurants and you see you see an ad for Rally Point Endeavors, another trusted partner where you know you're getting a great experience, where you know the, the conditions are very safe. And it's, it's like a good thing where we can start to bring partnerships and different affiliates into this through the use of technology as well, because these customers, I think a lot of our members and customers, what you've seen is they typically bought say a hundred things a week well, now they're buying 10 things a week. They're going with who they trust and who they care about and who is there for them. And, and what we've told our team and our talent is over deliver on everything you're doing for our members during this time. We are hoping to never stay with us. So continue to over deliver. And, and hopefully that's building up a bunch of credibility and care with them. And then we know they'll be back. And if you have partners and you have technology to, to kind of include the partners in what we're doing, it's just a bigger, better spend and share for our customers. So that's what we're trying to do as well. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, all of these experiences, you know, shopping for a new handbag, getting delicious pizza, getting this great workout, they're all emotional experiences at the end of the day. So we have to layer in that, some, that, that layer of gratification to them um, for it to be meaningful. So I have a question, Peter, um, you know, as, as, we, as we look forward and you talk about some of these new things that you plan to implement or have an experiment with um, AR, curbside client telling, um, how, are, how is that making you rethink about the potential store design or layout or how you think of like the front of house versus back of house experience, you know, the efficiencies of click and collect versus like experiential surprise and delight? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're, you're bringing up things that we've been thinking about for and, and watching change tremendously over the past couple of years. And I think uh, one of the, the conversations uh, in the industry that I briefly mentioned before, and, and you're probably all too familiar with, is the idea of showroom. So actually having kind of no stock room, right? And it's anytime you visit uh, a retail location, the manager will always be excited to show you how organized their stock room is. Because anytime they're in the stock room, it's taken them off of the sales floor. Uh, and they have less likelihood to convert. So there's an interesting thing that's been happening where it's like the showroom floors are becoming smaller, retail footprints are becoming smaller because there's not the need for stock rooms. But I think what happens is that there's long-term contracting lease obligations that exist. So in an ideal world, probably most people would move to limited footprints with incredibly flexible lease structures, but that's just not a reality of the organizations. Um, and, and just the, the kind of the, the financial structures that exist between store brand owners and, and mall operators. Um, where I see a really interesting intersection is, I mean, there's a lot that's been going on with using your stores as your fulfillment network so mm -hmm. that you can actually maximize uh, speed to consumer, minimize shipping costs by playing the zone game where it's if 
someone's in Chicago, we're able to ship out from our store in Chicago. Um, but I think what's, what's happening is there's the ex consumer expectations are shifting overnight, which now I order something from Amazon. I don't expect it here in two days. I expect it here in 14 days. Um, and you're happy I, that you just I, got it. You're just happy you got it. <laughs> but I think what Tom yeah. said is really important is that the conversation around customer service shifts in which I may be fine waiting 14 days, but if something goes wrong with it, I want to know they've got my back. I want to see that it's 60 day returns. I want to see that I can quickly reach someone at the brand to get resolution. And so where this takes me is, uh, and something that Brewer mentioned a little bit earlier is this idea of kind of destination and place making. So I see that there's an opportunity with our stores where it may not be that we're actually doing fulfillment, right? Ecom fulfillment out of the stores, but there's a way that it's kind of the pickup in store in which you can, I, I have speed to get the product and we're actually using the consumer to do the last mile. That's the thing that I'm almost most excited about um, because there is real concern too about a package arrives on your doorstep. What do you do? Am I supposed to leave it there for 24 hours? And then is it fine to pick up? Do I spray it down and wipe it with Lysol wipes? Do I leave it in my garage for 36 hours? I mean, there's kind of no playbook. There's conflicting mm -hmm. um, kind of points of view on that. But the one thing I know I'm comfortable with is if I drive to a restaurant and I pick that bag up and I drive home, I'm gonna eat it within 45 minutes. So I think that there's ways that you can actually empower the end consumer to be doing their own delivery. You can be playing up this idea of destination, right? Like I get excited about figuring out where I'm gonna eat on Friday night. And I research that for four or five days. And it may be the same way that talking about that duration of the purchase, right? That there's, there's instant gratification that exists online, but I also want to think about the purchase that I'm doing. So I think, I guess this is all a long-winded way of saying that I think that there's an opportunity to really leverage this, the stores maybe as showrooms, right? Minimize the, the kind of front of house um, and, and maximize the stock that we have, but engage in a sales cycle that's like, I, I order over the first four days of the week and I pick at a designated stop on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. I have a really rich interaction with a store associate. They can engage in much more comprehensive client telling. They can do research as to who I am, what my interests are. Um, and, and then I get to take that home. And so it's, I'm not waiting 14 days. I'm actually physically engaged with the handoff of the product from the brand to me as the end user. There's no intermediaries. Um, and, and I think that that's a really cool thing. Uh, I think that that's a speculative future. I, I hope that some of that holds true. Um, and I think our responsibility as, as operators is to have a series of speculative futures. That's just one that I'm representing. It's acknowledging that we, that 10 days from now that may be totally different, but there's, we have to be agile enough as an organization to allow some sort of mechanism to order online, to transfer that to the store, to, ha to have proper inventory in their stores and then to really figure out what that kind of handoff experience is and make sure that it's not too scripted. I, I think that's one scenario that I'm super excited about that kind of plays with the trends that we've been seeing in retail, retail design, and then the uh, true omni-channel experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, go ahead. Oh, hey, Melissa, sorry. Yeah, let me, let me just add one thing to that. It's interesting because a lot of people want to take a step back and say this change is terrible. I don't know how I'm going to operate. I don't know what it's going to happen in the brick and mortar side. But for us in, in my other panelists as well, it's like it's a huge opportunity to make sure that you are utilizing your space properly so a new customer becomes existing and never leaves. And so from my perspective, when I do have 30 people in a class, it's a little bit hectic. Everybody loves it because the communication with each other, the community component is huge, but it's tough for the trainers. And so now I get to actually lay out the, the space exactly the way I want it, make sure that safety is put first, but you put the equipment there and it's gonna run so smooth. And that's like, like Peter said, I'm so excited to actually have the flow change and we can blame the change on the government and on all the stuff that's happening, but truly it's an opportunity for me to redesign my sale floor, uh, which is a huge opportunity. And ultimately the, the member experience is going to be better. So it was nice kind of halftime break and now we'll get back at it. Yeah, absolutely. They, they say necessity drives innovation, right? So yeah. to your point, a lot of these thematic theme uh, themes that we've been talking about, we've talked about curbside and we've talked about showrooming and all these things, but now based on necessity, you have, you have to implement. Uh, these changes and have innovative and agile thinking. Um, so, I mean, this has been great. I see we're starting to get questions from the audience. Um, so I don't, if you want to drop those, maybe Bob, I, I see there's, um, there's some in queue, maybe we can weave into our conversation. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me read some of these questions coming in. If anyone has any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box at this point. 
Um, you know, one, one of the questions that, that came up that I think we, we answered to a, uh, to a high level, but I think it would be good for each of the, you know, the panelists uh, in, in retail restaurant and, and, and the gym side to answer is, you know, technology solutions that you've adopted during this time frame, of course, are, are important to kind of further your business. Uh, but as you think about these things, are there other, other channels that you're thinking about uh, implementing here in the future with, with technology? I'll jump in. I mean, a absolutely. My uh, marketing consultant that I work with, you know, last week said, how are we going to, people aren't going to want to touch menus, uh, especially people coming in for takeout. What, what are we going to do? All disposable? Are we going to have digital signage boards? That's something that we haven't used in our restaurants. We, we do sit down, you know, there's a certain level of um, formality. I mean, it's, you know, it's casual dining, but you know, we all knew the script, right? You walk in, waitress or waiter hands you a menu, you order drinks, a couple minutes later you order some appetizers, and we know how it goes. I think all that's going to change. Uh, not forever, not in every application, but for us, we, we do do quite a bit of takeout and delivery. And one thing we don't do a good job of at all is using technology to um, let people know what we have, what the specials are, using, you know, a menu board or some sort of digital signage. So that's, that's one that just immediately comes to mind. And, you know, we're, we're in the market for, you know, finding a solution. I, I mean, I think technology that we're evaluating is how we can really carry that conversation um, kind of on a level of one-to-one. -one, right. And there, there's kind of different evolutions that happen with how sophisticated your marketing organization may be where you move from kind of batch and blast to segments to perhaps one-to-one. -one. Um, and this is maybe more specific to retail um, because it, depending on the scale that you're operating in hospitality, it's like you may be able to have a real understanding of who all your end consumers are or at, as a trainer, you may understand who your consumers are, what their latent needs are, because you know them individually. Uh, but I think we're really invested in technology that one, uh, I guess, isn't creepy or removes the creep factor of like predictive intelligence and one-to-one -one communications. Uh, and I think that that's just realizing that right now, um, there's incredible sensitivity around this and that we're dealing with uh, health and human safety and that yes there's kind of that exists at a national level it exists as a state level it exists as a county level uh, we've been reviewing analytics based off of uh, ge geographic information and realizing that there are completely different behaviors but i think that we need information to make sure that in our stores a store in texas may operate very differently than a store in new york or a store in california or a store in seattle we need to make sure that they have the information to kind of be armed with one-to-one -one or what's appropriate communication uh, within those locations. So I think it's just continuing that evolution of a one-to-one -one conversation and using it to really empower us to, to kind of be compassionate, to be humble, um, and to be a true partner to our end consumers. Yeah, and just, and just quickly, I mentioned it earlier, but I think our, our opportunity is, I think we're in a growth mode right now. And so using technology to really coordinate a bunch of additional facilities and a bunch of different opportunities, like we mentioned, the commercial side or the residential side, using technology there to actually connect everything. So it's very, it's, it's held close enough where all of our members are getting kind of the same offering, but everything's connected through different uses of technology. I think that's our best opportunity because at the end of the day, within these facilities, everybody's going to pick up a barbell, hey, put the pull-up bar, and that's not going to change. There's not much technology involved in there, and that's what they kind of like about it. Um, but the ability to, to reach more members and reach people, when our members kind of look online and say, who can I trust that it's cleanliness and there's good customer reviews, people are seeing results and they feel healthy, they feel preventive health is being delivered. We need to be at the forefront of that answer. And you know, there's, there's a dark side to all this too. And, and it's, it's this, you know, there's not a lot of technology involved with a customer walking past my restaurant, smelling delicious pizza and coming in to grab some food. They can't do that right now. We're, we're locking our doors and we're letting people in, you know, they order court curbside. But as more and more ordering goes online, what happens if your phones go down? We've had that happen in the last couple of, 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 of weeks and it's super frustrating and it can be hugely disruptive. Um, so that's something that we're looking at too is redundancy and trying to figure out, you know, different order modes and, 
and and that you know that's going to be an increasing need i think of a lot of people as they move to more especially in, in my sector restaurants more of an online internet-based experience great we have a new question that just came in uh how do mom and pop or small retailers of consumer products uh face these challenges I mean, I, I'm trying to think about like where to, to take that question because I think it deals with this idea of brick and mortar versus clicks. Um, so I think it's probably never been easier for mom and pops to spin up e-commerce presences um, with, with the advent of just a, a myriad of e-com platforms that are cost effective. Um, I think probably more important, it's figuring out how you maintain a relationship with the consumers that you have, that you want to stay top of mind. Uh, and so you have to figure out what those touch points are um, and how that works. Uh, so I, I think it would depend with consumer goods. I mean, what is the level of client telling that you do? Um, I'd imagine that most mom and pop retailers probably have black books, have some way of figuring out who their consumers are and have kind of first name relationships with them. It's probably similar to what Tom deals with their brewer deals with. I mean, they kind of know the person that comes in every Friday night and what type of pizza they're gonna order. Um, and it's just demonstrating that you're human. It's reach, reaching out to them, it's being proactive. Um, it's separating the kind of the sell from the idea that this is, is a relationship. Um, but that's where I would probably think the opportunity lies is one, if you don't have digital storefronts is to figure out a way to get a digital storefront up to make sure that you can repurpose the the, retail location that you have as a fulfillment center. And then two is to figure out ways to extend beyond the cell and uh, operate kind of authentically as a brand and as a real person, um, but making sure that this isn't all about just kind of leveraging an incremental sales opportunity. Yeah, I, I think that's like, it's so critically important, especially in even the, fine, or the fitness side, is people need to do the math and figure out if the cost, cause a lot of people like, I just want to stay in business. Well, you didn't get into business just to stay in business. And so you really need to take a look like, Hey, look, if I make this investment, especially in technology, do like have milestones where you're making sure that you're getting, getting the bang for the buck. You need to maintain margins during this time because what we don't want to see and, and we're trying to help competitors with this is we don't want them just to stay afloat for six months and to lose an additional 50,000 bucks that they didn't necessarily need to lose. Like you, you need to make it's tough decisions, but do the math and make sure that the iteration you're making has your margins and has your hurdle rates in mind to make sure that you're just not throwing away money. Cause you just want to show that you survived. I think just, you go bring up something really interesting around this idea of price integrity. And it's been handled a variety of different ways. I mean, you can, retailers are literally going out of business and there will be fire sales. You can watch other companies or other retailers where you go on their site and every single day it's 30% off. Um, I think there's some interesting retailers out there that have basically said, hey, we're just going to lower our price while this exists. And it's kind of like, help us keep our business going and realize that this is a temporary impairment, but not training them to expect the discount. Like, I think that there really does have to be a, a strong consideration to cost controls and margin while we're going through this and making sure that you're not training the consumer to always expect a discount. And there's no perfect formula for that. It's just being aware of it, I think, helps with the conversation. Well, and, and related to that, uh, training everybody that on the other side of this, everything is going to be more expensive. I, mean, I just got an email yesterday that our pork price, we buy you know, wholesale fresh pork uh, from a great uh, distributor and they just marked it 40% higher overnight, 40%. Uh, and it's already our most expensive ingredient. And it's like, you know, what do we do? Do we raise the price? I mean, maybe it's temporary, we can eat it, but that, that we're going to be, we already are cleaning our stores much more often. Uh, we're buying more expensive chemicals. I, I heard Tom mention he's he's got a similar chemical that we have. It kills things on contact, but it's not cheap, you know. And 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 all those costs are are gonna in some way you're gonna have to you're gonna you're gonna have to make sense of it. You're gonna have to add it into the price. And I think everyone's gonna have to realize that a lot of things are gonna get more expensive. Yeah, and that's this, this might be a question to, to, to Brewer and Tom. Um, 
you know, what we're seeing from small businesses is also putting in some type of loyalty programs, right? You know, it's, they, they have their customer base, right? And people get emails all the time, right? You get a, a thousand of them. So they just kind of become secondary. But how do you engage your customers through loyalty programs and those types of things? And so I don't know if you guys are, are looking at that, seeing that. Is that a trend that you're seeing? We're, we're seeing it across a lot of small businesses to try to, to, to help encourage them from going into big box stores and, and coming in locally? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So in this, this goes along with, with what Peter was saying as well is because with loyalty program, and I'll tell you what we've done specifically, you still need to do the math and make sure that the program you have is, is something that can maintain a margin for you. And so specifically what we've done is every day the facility has been closed or the facilities have been closed, our members that continue to pay us, we built a loyalty program called Rally Bucks. And so they use these Rally Point Bucks. They'll use it for apparel, for food, for personal training sessions. And so they will, they will redeem those. And so basically they got all the money back, but it's for them staying with us when they're really getting a product that they didn't sign up for. And so, but what we've done and, and I challenge and hope all the kind of mom and pops or smaller shops can do this as well is, I can't allow them to use rally bucks for membership fees in June if we're open, because obviously you're going to put yourself in a bigger hole when you're trying to do the right thing for these guys. So you have to be very creative and push them towards, ideally they all redeem it for apparel. And so they're marketing my, my facilities around town. But so you want to be creative, be smart, but also be very transparent with your members because when they're here and they're continuing to pay and not coming in, they are so loyal and communication and transparency is what keeps them loyal. And we do what we say we're going to do. And so that's kind of the challenge on these, on the loyalty program side. Just real quick, the big challenge for us uh, uh, has always been interoperability across platforms. We, uh, we accept orders and they gouge us, but Grubhub, Eat Street, and, um, we have our own native online ordering and just the, 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 the different platforms. It's, it's almost impossible. Our, we haven't found a system that allows us to um, sort of communicate that across platforms. So that's always been a limitation, but I mean, we, we do e-marketing and, and there's a lot of other things that we do, but I mean, loyalty is huge in the industry. Uh, we personally have not had a great experience with finding the right uh, provider. Yeah. I, I think it's also to realize that loyalty, we think about it, the four R's of loyalty, which comes down to respect, reciprocity, recognition, and rewards. And rewards is only one piece of it. And we tend to think like our credit card provider, right? I spend $1, I get one point, that's redeemable. And there's like, even though there's not a cash value for it, I think very transactionally about it. And I think the important thing with loyalty is, is making sure that rewards is one pillar of it. There's four pillars to loyalty and that there's ways of engaging it that don't necessarily rely on always platforms that are kind of cash back dollar amounts that kind of eat away at the margin. Um, so I, I just, I always try to frame it as like, you want it to surprise and delight. You want it to be anticipatory. You want to recognize your best customers. You want to approach them with open language. Like, and there's other things you can do besides just compressing your margins. Yeah. I know we're almost out of time here, uh, but wanted to take one more question here, um, just, to, just to make sure that we get a, as many questions answered as possible. I think the first question is, is for Tom, uh, Peter, and Brewer, and the second question, really specifically, uh, really for Nick. Uh, so the first part of the question is, uh, do you think the, the feds will mandate safe zones in restaurants and retail? Uh, the second section of that is, uh, if I'm uh, anticipating putting a, you know, outdoor seating, uh, is that something uh, that you guys can help with and, and how do you use technology to be able to do that? So I think that's the second part that Nick, you can answer. But to start with Tom, um, Peter and Brewer, if, if you want to take a stab at the first part. I, I mean, I'm, I'll jump in. I mean, I, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of local control. We're seeing a lot of states' rights. We're seeing a lot of language. I mean, it is all over the place. And for example, in Chicago, it's illegal to do some things and they actually will fine you in Wisconsin you're not supposed to do it, but there's, there's no penalty if you do. So I think there's going to be a lot of um, interpretation. So I think all restaurant owners are going to just need to bone up on local code and constantly being a dialogue with your, um, w w with your health department and your, your, your really your county and, and, and city government. 
Yeah, and I, I would echo that too. It's you need to talk to for anywhere from the police enforcement to your local communities and just figure out kind of where it's at because we do not want to just open up and say we're open for business. We're getting back to it. Even if phase one has 10 people, we're having 10 people. We want to be open, honest, transparent with everybody out there. Just so if say the police do stop by, just make sure that they give you a thumbs up and they actually ask to join a class. And so <laughs> it's funny because the only thing I've been right about during this whole time is not being right. And so we <laughs> Um, but, but we're prepared for everything. You just have to kind of see how it flows, but just always put safety first. And when you actually come at it, like we did this from a safety perspective, everybody kind of falls in line behind that and says, okay, we trust what you're doing. I so, you so I get, go ahead. Go, no, I was going to say two, two, two points. I, I, I still think Tom should implement uh, VR for his before <laughs> customers. And they can see what their what a six pack would look like if yeah. uh, they come they come work out at his gym. So, I think that would be uh, a, a great use of technology. Um, you know, but when it comes to outdoor seating and and those types of things and, and trying to extend this digital platform into these areas that typically don't have uh, aren't set up for that. Um, you know, that's something that you know we've developed our technology around for real simple, easy plug and play enterprise networks that you can plug in during working hours, you can unplug them and take them back and still have that uh, connected experience. Um, we do that today. Um, so that's not something new for us, but I think it is new for some of the restaurateurs that maybe weren't thinking about this. I I'll give you an example. My brother-in-law is in the restaurant business in Michigan and outside is a big portion, but there's only a certain window of time, right? So how do you maximize that, right? With the times today, implementing digital menus and digital signs and maybe virtual servers and all those types of things that, you know, that all of them are, are dealing with today. So the, the, the basis is the platform, right? You need to have that network in place to be able to layer on all these types of cool technologies on top of it. Absolutely. Awesome. 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 Well, it looks like we're, we're out of time. I did want to put up uh, all the panelists information uh, in case you, you did want to uh, contact any of them for additional questions. Uh, so hopefully you can see my screen there. Thank you again uh, to Melissa for hosting and thank you to all the panelists for taking the time out today. And uh, if, if there's anyone that wants to again talk to any of the panelists or Simplify and Radiant, uh, please feel free to reach out. We're happy to take your questions and, and help you during these periods. I want Nick to tell me more about networking my dining patios, but we can do that. All, <laughs> all right. Thanks. No problem. Awesome. <laughs> all right. Thank thanks, you. everybody. Thank you Appreciate all. Great speaking it. with you all. Thank you.